sermons tonight. Man, you guys are packed over there. Jeez. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are always there for us. No matter the circumstance, no matter the situation, we can call on you any time of any day, Lord, and you're there for us. I pray and ask, Lord Jesus, that we would incline our ear to your word. Heavenly Father, grant us the grace to apply it. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for the words to live by, for giving us the instruction manual of life, Lord God. And I ask that you would help us to implement it each and every day to glorify you in everything that we say, do, and think. Be with us here now this evening. I pray and ask all this in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. Have a seat. You ever feel like you just need to catch your breath? Take a big breath? You've been running? I was scrolling through Facebook and I saw a, a post that said, it mentioned something that I think we can all relate with. You ever feel like you're drowning in life? And what do you do? One, don't worry. Stay calm because your lifeguard walks on water. When you feel like you're drowning in life, don't worry, stay calm. Your lifeguard walks on water. And that ties right into what we're going to talk about tonight. And the title tonight is, Why Are You Shocked? Why are you shocked? Why is it that we are so taken off guard when trials come our way? <clears throat> There's two pictures up there in particular that if you watch the show, you know the scene. So go ahead, chuckle, look at it, get it out of the way. <laughs> but why are we shocked when trials come our way? Why do we get overwhelmed or all surprised when things don't go as planned? or when pushback comes in our life. There are two thoughts that spurned tonight's message. The first coming from Pastor Folio and the second coming um, from the Apostle Peter that Pastor Folio has taught about often. Number one, don't let a good trial go to waste. Learn what you're supposed to learn. Change what you're supposed to change. Don't let a good trial go to waste. And two, be on the alert. It's a heads up, church. They are coming. Trials in life, temptations in life, testing in life, they are coming. And I've noticed that you might want to buckle up a little bit extra when you set your mind to doing right, when you purpose to, we're going to get after this, because the devil don't like that too much. He does not want to see you commit yourself and hold the standard. So buckle up a little bit more when you look to take that approach. Two texts for tonight's topic, both come from 1 Peter. The first one being 1 Peter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. Do not be surprised. And the second is 1 Peter 5, 8 through 10. Be sober, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. There's a quote that I came across that fits where we're going and talking about trials. And it's one of those quotes that I, if we can apply the principle, it's an absolute game changer to life. And the quote is this, when you replace why is this happening to me with what is this trying to teach me? Everything changes. When you replace why is this happening to me with what is this trying to teach me? Everything changes. 
We've been in these situations where we ask, why is my husband the way that he is? Flip it. Why does my wife seem not to hear or listen to me? Flip it. Why do my parents treat me the way that they do? Flip it. What are you supposed to learn? What is this trying to teach you? Why does so-and-so act that way? Why does my teacher do what they do? Why does my coach coach the way they coach? Why do I have this job? Why does no one listen to me? Again, all circumstances and situations that we can relate to and all circumstances and situations where we can choose to flip it instead of asking, why is this happening to me? And what is this trying to teach me? See, life and the trials that come with life are just the beginning. They're not going anywhere. But they remind me, the trials of life remind me of bus rides. They remind me of bus rides. And most recently, bus rides in Guatemala. For those of you that have been on a missions trip to Guatemala, getting to Guatemala in and of itself is quite the journey. Flying. TSA, security, trying to make it to your flight on time, quite the journey. But there is a different kind of journey once you (laughs) enter Guatemala, and it is the journey of a bus ride. Now, before we get there, I want to say this too. We need to be careful on how we evaluate success. We need to evaluate success the way God evaluates it and not the world. See, just maybe the Lord is working to produce peace in the midst of your heart as you face a troubling and trying situation. Or perhaps he's trying to work out forgiveness in your heart. Or maybe he's trying to work out trust as he puts you in a certain situation. See, if we accept the world standards of success and victory, when you're in those situations, you're going to feel defeated. But if you look at it and see it through God's eyes, that he is trying to accomplish something in you through the situation, you'll find that the Lord is succeeding each and every time. Replace the why with what is this trying to teach me? Now, the journey of a bus ride, you get off a plane, you step foot in a terminal in a third world country, immediately different, and you board a bus, very nice bus, do not get me wrong, has air conditioning, the seats are nice, but inevitably, you are faced with traffic, and it's not just a little bit of traffic, y'all, I mean, I'm talking traffic, massive amounts of it, all different sizes of vehicles, coming at you from all different speeds and all different directions. Massive amounts of traffic. And that traffic reminds me of the trials and cares of life. Come at you from all different directions. Some of it you see coming, some of it quite unexpected. Some of it creeps up on you. Some of it you can plan for. Some of them happen fast and unexpectedly, and others you might have a handle on. But if you're in a major city, traffic is something that you would expect. So why would the traffic and trials of life surprise us? They're a part of life just as much as crazy traffic is part of a major city. Think about it. If you're trying to get into downtown Pittsburgh at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, are you expecting it to be smooth sailing? Or are you expecting everybody under the sun to stop at a stoplight that is imaginary right at the tunnel and it to back all the way up 376? What are you expecting? Are you expecting Grant Street at 3 o'clock in the afternoon to be completely free of traffic? No, you're not. And you wouldn't expect that. So why are we surprised, why are we shocked at trials when they come in our life? 
Are you shocked when the sun rises at 6.30 in the morning on a, on a sunny summer morning? You're not shocked. Are you shocked when the plants grow as you have planted them each and every year? You're not shocked. Are you shocked when your pet needs to go outside to go to the bathroom? Probably not surprised by that. Are you surprised when dishes get dirty or the bathroom needs cleaned? Not one bit. So again, why is it that we are shocked when the traffic of life happens? Why are we shocked when trials and circumstances appear in our lives? Something else that we do when we drive the bus of life and trials come our way. How many of you try to hurry up and get in the other lane? Not actually, I know some of you do. Bumper to bumper, that lane's moving faster. Let me hurry up and get over there. The grass is not always greener on the other side, church. Don't always look to go with the new fad. Don't always look to go with the preacher that is the newest and hottest sensation on Instagram. Do not look to do it your own way or to hurry up and get this over with. Learn what you must, change what you must, but don't be surprised. And stick to what's being taught in the Word of God. Things are going better for people over there. And then when you get over there, you realize they're not working out at all what they look like. You try this and you try that and it's not working out. What we need to be doing is staying the course that is preached from this pulpit every Sunday, that is preached from the Word of God, and not get shocked, rattled, thrown off your horse when tough times show up. But what we need to be doing is putting our faith and trust in the Lord, asking for his strength to get through this situation, learn what we must without worry and without fret, and without asking why. Also, what needs to happen on this bus? If something needs tweaked, would you not ask the mechanic would you not ask, what do I need to be doing differently with your pastor? Would you not rather seek out counsel to someone who may know better rather than just trying to fix this on the fly yourself? See, what happens when we worry and we fret, we sabotage ourselves, church. We get in the way of what God is trying to do because we are no longer trusting and obeying. We're no longer believing when we allow worry and fret and anxiety to enter our minds. When we are asking why and questioning why is this happening to me or happening this way or why is this circumstance in our life, instead of seeking to call upon God, we're calling God into an account. When we should be looking internally and question again, what do I need to be learning from this situation? When we call God into account, we're no longer trusting and obeying or believing. We're sabotaging our prayers and we're wondering why they're not getting answered. When we worry and we fret in the midst of those tough situations and we try to figure it all out on our own, we're interfering with what God is trying to do. And we may be delaying what God is trying to work out in us. Because of our worry and fret, we get in the way of what God is trying to work. Because worry and fret is unbelief. Look at Mark 6, 5 through 6. And he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. Something else that happens on bus rides and especially in Guatemala, that I am very grateful for. Rest stops. An opportunity to get out, stretch your legs, get refreshed, grab something to drink. They have interesting things at rest stops in Guatemala. Aloe water. Fantastic. Something to snack on. Something to help you get through the rest of your journey. And so it is in life. I can think of two area, rest areas that happen in life that happen twice a week. They're called church, Sunday and Wednesday. Think about it. 
You have weaved through all the traffic of life all week. You have dealt with yourself. You have dealt with other people. You have tried to avoid getting in that fast lane over there because it looks really good. You have dealt with yourself about having a good mood, a good attitude, responding rightly. And then Wednesday shows up and you get a chance to get out, stretch your legs, get refreshed, encourage one another, and take advantage of meeting together. But in the middle of that, there's a lot of us sometimes that think it's not a big deal to miss church. It's not a big, big deal to miss that rest area along the way. And just like driving, we think, oh, I'll get the next one. And we miss out what would have been helpful for the rest of the week. We miss out on something that would be taught, spoke upon, that is going to help us get through the traffic for the rest of the week. Or you wonder why you find yourself broke down between rest stops. What happened between Sunday and Wednesday? I broke down because I missed the opportunity to gather, to refresh, to get encouraged, and to hear the word of God. In Guatemala, once you arrive at Hope of Life, one would think your bus rides end. Oh no, quite the contrary. Quite the contrary. You have to take a bus ride everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. And sometimes the the road is smooth. Sometimes it's bumpy. And sometimes it's just, I have no clue how we're getting there, but we're going to go up that road. Again, that's life. Sometimes it's smooth, church. And sometimes things get bumpy and rough. Why do we get shocked and surprised by this? Why do we get so bummed out when things get tough? Or a testing or a trial comes your way. Why do we allow ourselves to start to doubt or worry in these times? And why do we get so discouraged with ourselves? Could it be, I pose this question, could it be that our eyes have shifted from where they need to be during those times? Our trust has shifted from where it needs to be, and rather than being on Jesus Christ, we begin to focus and trust on ourself. We get stuck on ourself, our own way of thinking, the trials that are before us, the woe is me, no one likes me, no one understands what I'm going through. We are no longer walking by faith or in faith, but we are now walking in the futility of our own mind when we allow ourselves to go there. Here's the other thing about these rest areas or these rest stops in life. They're a chance to see if your bus needs serviced. It's a chance to see and examine what may need changed. And a chance to do it before you get too far down the road and cause any more damage. Making sure your bus is serviced correctly allows you to endure the traffic and the bumps and the trials of life better. What happens too, I think sometimes when we hear fiery ordeals in that scripture or trials, our thinking goes immediately to catastrophic events the heart-wrenching circumstances, the loss of loved ones, the persecution of Christians around the world for their faith and their willingness to serve the Lord. And that is true, 100% that's true. And there are situations that are tough to endure, but these are not the only types of fiery ordeals, church. Anything, any event, any situation, any circumstance, any moment where your faith is tested, where you are challenged to trust and completely and fully obey the Lord, that is a test in a fiery ordeal. See, when you're in a fiery ordeal, when you're in a situation, they look like this. When you're in a situation, if you're to choose whether to grumble or complain, that's a fiery ordeal. When you have the choice to respond poorly or not respond poorly to your spouse. 
a fiery ordeal may be car trouble, financial trouble. When you have an issue at school or with a coach, when you have the opportunity to judge or hold a grudge, when you have the choice to gossip or not, maybe when the comforts of life are taken off of you or from you. Sometimes a fire ordeal is when you have the choice to either stay in bed or get up and go to church. When you have the choice to trust fully and obey God or not, that's a fiery ordeal. And why, again, are we shocked when we are in these situations? It's life. Why are we shocked or surprised when we find out things aren't going well or going our way? See, why are we shocked when someone doesn't do right by us? Why are we shocked when somebody doesn't pay us back? Or why are you shocked when somebody misunderstands you? I mean, after all, I speak perfectly. I articulate everything well. Why am I shocked when anybody misunderstands me? That's sarcasm, Colin. That's sarcasm. Why are we shocked when we get sick? Why are we shocked when we encounter somebody that believes differently or thinks differently than we do? Or maybe this one. You have a sweet, obedient child, and you've been enrolled in Parenting 101. Or maybe you've been blessed with a child that tests you to the nth degree, and you're enrolled in Parenting 505. Rather than wondering, what did I do wrong to deserve such a great child, or what have I done wrong to be in this amazing circumstance, we might consider the more challenging child or the circumstance a blessing and an opportunity to become more Christ-like yourself. Think about it. With which child will your patience, your long-suffering, your kindness, your willingness to properly discipline, and other Christ-like virtues most likely be tested, developed, and refined? Could it possibly be that we need that child or that circumstance just as much as that child needs us? And so it is with any other trial or tough situation. Quit thinking, why me? And think and look at it from a perspective of what am I to learn in this situation? 1 Corinthians 10:13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Over the next few weeks, we're going to look at five aspects. I boiled it down to five aspects of trials and tough situations and circumstances of life. Basically, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be picking apart pastor's sermon on trials and temptation with a fine-tooth comb. But this is what it's boiled down to. We'll give you the synopsis here tonight. The first, the purpose of trials. Why are these suckers in our life? One, to get our attention, to teach us something, to test us, and sometimes for our discipline. See, all of it is in an effort by Jesus himself to draw us closer to him and let us get us to become more Christ-like. We've asked him to save us. That is his purpose in our life each and every day with every circumstance and trial that may come our way. He is looking to perfect us and make us more Christ-like. 2 Chronicles 32, 31. Even in the matter of the envoys, of the rulers of Babylon who sent, who sent to him to inquire of the wonder that had happened in the land. God left him alone only to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. 
And let endurance have its perfect result in you so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In John 16, 33, it says, Jesus says, in the world you will have trouble. Be on, be, take, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And if you remember in our text in 1 Peter, it says our trials and testings come for our perfecting, to confirm us, to strengthen us, and to establish us. The second point that we will explore along the way here in the next few weeks, the source of strength during trials. One should be the Lord. And with that comes the question, who do you lean on? Or what do you lean on? Is it a gallon of chocolate chunk ice cream? Is it a movie on the Hallmark Channel? Not knocking either one. Or does your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who knows all about it and knows what you need? Something else should be a source of strength during your trials. The joy of the Lord. Something that I preach to our youth, to your children, is nothing. Nothing takes your joy away. Nothing or no one takes your good mood or your good attitude away. You choose to give it away when you choose not to fight to keep it. The joy of the Lord should be your strength. And how do you keep that joy? Praise the Lord. Praise him with a shout. Lift up your voice. Pray. Talk to Jesus. Think of the example of Paul and Silas. Did what God would have them to do. They did it. God asked them to go, proclaim the gospel, and they get in trouble for it. They get beat up for it. They get put in prison for it. Again, church, we could be going about things the right way, doing what we know we should be doing. It does not exempt us from trials and testing. What do you do in those trials and tests? Paul and Silas, I'm going to praise the Lord in my tough circumstance. I'm going to give everything back to God, trusting that he knows what's best for me and is going to do what needs done. Psalms 121, verse 2. My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. My help comes from the Lord, not from my own wisdom, not from my intellect, not from my amazing IQ. My help comes from the Lord and applying the principles that he lays out in the word of God. When I am weak, he is strong. 2 Corinthians 12.10. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distress, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Here's the thing about distresses and persecution and difficulties and insults. They can come from anybody, intentional or unintentional. They can come from family members. They can come from your children. They can come from your worst enemy. But in anything, for when I am weak, he is strong. Psalms 46.1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Not might be, he is our refuge and strength. It is just our responsibility to go to him, to do what he has instructed. And then in Nehemiah 8.10, then he said to them, go, eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Do not be grieved when hard times come, when the trial comes, when the tough situation comes. Look at it as an opportunity. In my mind, what I try to do is prove the devil wrong. Oh, you think that's going to happen? All right, let's go there. Let's go. We'll have this fight. Trusting in the Lord, trusting in his strength to be able to respond properly and learn what we're supposed to in the circumstance. The third thing we're going to look at, your perspective. What is your perspective during trials and trying circumstances? 
I would encourage us to remember the big picture, eternity. The goal is heaven. So many times we're stuck here and, oh my God, my son didn't clean his room for the fourth day in a row. And we lose our mind. We allow it to get to us more than it should. Remember the big picture. The goal is heaven. And I would ask this question. Is driving this bus of life according to the word of God worth it? That's something that you have to work out in yourself. I will tell you this, it is worth it. It's the only way to get to heaven. But don't lose sight. Keep the perspective of what is this trying to teach me? What can I learn? Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.18 for I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Stop and think about that for a minute. Just let that one soak in. For I consider that this suffering, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. The fourth thing that we're going to take a look at. We need to remember that God is with us. Sometimes you just need to be reminded of that. God is with you. A couple more questions to consider here. If you believe that he has your best interest in mind, if you truly believe that the Lord Jesus Christ himself has your best interest in mind, then what is there to fear? What is there to worry about? What is there to get all worked up about? If we believe he has the whole world in his hands, there's nothing to fear, church. There isn't anything that you're going to walk through that he's not going to be there with you. So again, why are we shocked? Why do we get worked up? Why do we worry? Isaiah 41.10 do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Church, there is not a reason in the world for us, not to, worry, for us to worry. None. And then the fifth thing that we are going to look at over the next few weeks, amazing example. The amazing examples laid out for us by particular people in facing fiery ordeals, hard times, and challenging circumstances. The first person that comes to mind for me is Joseph. Sold by his own brothers into slavery. Just stop there. If anybody had a reason to have a complex, sold by his own family into slavery. It didn't end there. Wrongfully accused. Wrongfully, not just wrongfully accused, wrongfully accused of rape. He finally gets a reprieve in prison. Think about that, a reprieve in prison, and then he's forgotten about in prison. We're going to learn a lot from Joseph. How about Job? Everything, absolutely everything stripped away from him unexpectedly all in one day. Gone. All of his possessions, sons and daughters, gone. That is a fiery ordeal. Or how about King David? His king, King Saul, the man he's following, trying to kill him. All while David is trying to follow him wholeheartedly, he's trying to kill him. 
David becomes king. His own son usurps his throne. Own son. Fire your deal? I think so. And then there's the Apostle Paul. Holy smokes, fire your deals. Beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, flogged with 39 stripes five times. Five times. Placed in prison numerous times. House arrest numerous times. How did he get through fire deals? And then the greatest example of them all, Jesus. Despised and rejected by his own. Despised. Spit on. Shunned. Fought at every turn by his own people. So tonight, church, I would remind us, do not be surprised, do not be caught off guard by trouble and trials that come in your life. They're a part of life, but they certainly can be overcome by faith, trust, and obedience to the word of God. And recognize, get this, God is ultimately in control. He has your best interest in mind. We may not be able to see or reason why our, challenge, our challenges or trials or troubling situations come. And we might not know the purpose right away. But rest assured, you serve a sovereign God who is doing his best to save you. He is working behind the scenes for our benefit. It is our responsibility to have the right attitude and mentality to look at what can we learn from the situation that we're in. And avoid, absolutely avoid at all costs, resentment, bitterness, envy, and the temptation to ask why and call God into an account. Determine in your heart, your mind, your soul, everything that is in you to pass the test that is before you, to pass the trial that is before you and to do it all with a right spirit. The youth are probably absolutely have heard this at nauseum. Two things that you can always control. Your attitude and effort in any situation. You can always control your attitude and effort level in any situation you find yourself in. In any temptation that comes your way. In any trial, hard situation of life. You can always control your attitude and effort. And I would close with the quote that we started with. When you replace the why is this happening to me with what is this trying to teach me, everything changes. Church, don't be shocked. They're coming. They're here for our perfecting, for our encouragement. Encourage one another. Pray for one another. You know how you feel when you're going through them. So does everybody else all the more to lift each other up in prayer. And don't be shocked. Look to learn what we're supposed to in each and every situation. Amen. Pastor, anything? God bless, gentlemen. Come on up.